After you guys seem to enjoy our last video on the behind the scenes of the original 1995 Power Rangers movie, I thought it would be fun to delve into the Turbo movie next. Again, this information all comes from the Power Rangers Ultimate Visual History book, which, as I said in the previous video, is an absolute must for any Power Rangers fan. This is not in any way sponsored by them, I just genuinely think it's an awesome book. So, most of the following facts and quotes are from that book. I hope you guys enjoy. So after the success of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie, and the rise in popularity in the franchise in general, after they reinvented the series with Power Rangers Zeo, the time seemed right for another movie. Again, utilising Ranger costumes from a different Sentai series, but shooting all original footage within the United States. The film would also feature two extremely popular Rangers that had previously left the show, Jason Lee Scott, also known as Austin St. John, and Kimberly Ann Hart otherwise known as Amy Jo Johnson. Director David Winnin was selected to head the Turbo movie. He had worked on kids' shows like Goosebumps and Are You Afraid of the Dark, but had never directed a big studio movie. He had to take a crash course on all things Power Rangers before filming began, as he had never worked on the show before. The production was shot then over four months, utilising ten different locations and several studios throughout Southern California. The production included a miniature unit and a unit in Hawaii that shot the background footage, making extensive use of the pirate ship in San Pedro and an underwater tank in Marina del Rey. The script was a fun fantasy adventure, and the concept was go low-tech just like classic adventure movies. Yuda Ako said, We took the original ingredients of the series and added more fun new elements and locations to create a richer experience. The story, which was written by Shell Danielson and Shucky Levy, centres on the feisty space pirate Divatox, played by actress Hilary Shepard. Divatox is captain of the Subcraft, a ship that can travel through water or space and resembles a mechanical barracuda, complete with fins. She has come to Earth to find Lerigo, a short, furry wizard from the planet Liaria, who can open intergalactic portals throughout the universe. He has a magical key that will allow Divatox to travel through an interdimensional gateway to the island of Maranthius, where the powerful lava-like demon Malagor is imprisoned in a volcano. Divatox's intentions are to free Malagor, marry him, and use his power to gain untold riches and universal rule. As Divatox needs two humans of purity and strength to sacrifice to Malagor, she has her nephew Elgar kidnap Jason Lee Scott and Kimberly Hart. Now the Rangers must save their friends and stop Divatox and her foot soldiers. Prior to shooting Turbo, a Power Rangers movie, Steve Cardenas had informed the producers that he wanted to return to teaching martial arts, and so the character's departure was written into the script. As the movie opens, Rocky, who is of course played by Cardenas, is badly injured while training for a competition. When the other Rangers visit him in hospital, they're followed by Justin Stewart, played by Blake Foster, a kid that Tanya and Kat had encountered. Justin hides under Rocky's hospital bed and learns the Power Rangers' true identities when their communicators go off and they teleport away. Blake Foster had been acting since he was in diapers. Literally. I started appearing in Huggies commercials when I was 18 months old, Foster says. When he was 11, Foster was cast in the film Rusty A Dog's Tale, directed by Shucky Levy. I was a huge fan of Power Rangers growing up, he says. I had been training in martial arts since I was four years old, and Shucky saw me doing some flips and karate moves on the set of the movie. One day he asked me how I felt about being a Power Ranger. I thought he was kidding, but he told me he was serious. Levy then brought Austin St. John and Amy Jo Johnson to the set to meet the next Blue Ranger. I was in shock, Foster says. Next thing I knew I was reading for the Turbo movie. They had actually created a part for me, so I didn't even have to audition. So, to rescue Kimberly and Jason, the Rangers are given new powers and new vehicle-themed Zords. Cars, vans and trucks that incorporate Turbo technology. The movie's drivable Turbo Zords were crafted by George Barris, who also designed spy cars for James Bond movies and the 1965 Batmobile. The four Turbo Rangers drive across the desert after Divatox. To their surprise, the Blue Rangers 4x4 truck drives up and outsteps Justin, who tells them that Zordon has made him the new Blue Ranger. When Justin morphs, he grows to adult size. The filming schedule was, as always, extremely tight. The show was still filming right up until the movie started shooting, says art director Stephen Miller. I was running the Power Rangers Zeo shoot and Yuda Ako was on the Turbo movie. 
Miller had only two weeks of pre-production time left to prepare his designs when he switched to working on the film. High on Miller's list were the space-age jet skis ridden by Divatox's soldiers. We got the jet skis from a promo house, Miller explains. Because they were on loan, they couldn't be painted or altered in any way. So we had a seamstress come up from San Pedro and create canvas skins for them that we could paint. The Piranatron stunt team would shoot out of a practical, life-size subcraft facade built in the South Bay area of Los Angeles, ride around on the waves and then drive the jet skis onto the beach. These stunt guys on the jet skis sometimes went up to speeds of 90 miles an hour, says Miller, so we were just praying that those canvases stayed on. In Turbo, Zordon, played in the tube by Winston Richard, but still voiced by Robert Manahan, tells the Power Rangers that they can follow Divatox on a phantom pirate ship, the Ghost Galleon. The Ghost Galleon itself is played by the two-masted brig Pilgrim, a replica of a famous cargo ship now permanently moored at Dana Point, California. The Pilgrim would be seen in that same year in the Steven Spielberg film Amistad. On the first day of filming on the Pilgrim, more mishaps happened after the crew was finally transported to the ship. I had literally just arrived on day one of shooting, recalls director David Winnin, and was being delivered to the pirate ship moored out at sea a mile or so from the beach in a Zodiac raft. While Winning was stepping out of the raft, he was hit by a wave and somehow he popped his knee. As a result, the director was in great pain and had trouble walking. This was an hour into shooting my first studio feature for 20th Century Fox, he says. Needless to say, I was a bit panicked, but I motored on. I clearly remember driving home from San Pedro to my apartment in Burbank with an ice pack jammed against my knee. It healed up eventually, but I was actually going through physiotherapy appointments the first few weeks so that I could walk. The original script for the film, titled Race to the Volcano, was 150 pages, which would have made for a very long movie, especially one aimed at a younger audience. A number of scenes were filmed that ended up on the cutting room floor, including a fight with a crocodile, an underwater sequence in which the rangers befriend a mermaid, and a longer journey through the volcano, and more development of the Justin Stewart character. There were two amazing sets that never made the final cut, winning reveals. In an early version of the film, on their way to the volcano, the rangers first had to enter a smaller chamber dome filled with coloured quicksand and bubbling lava. The only way to make it across was by jumping into several large rocks. This was a very cool set, he recalls, but it was complicated to film in because it was essentially a swimming pool of sticky coloured liquid. Stephen Miller adds, There were hundreds and hundreds of gallons of metal cellulose that was the goop laying on the floor that the rangers had to rock hop to get over. After three days, that stuff started to smell, and we had to keep that set for almost two weeks. The second set deleted from the film was the Hall of Snakes, a great thin hallway with elaborate statues of cobras on the walls. We had sculptors come in and carve the snakes, and rigged them with little tubes where they would squirt smoke through their mouths. They also had crystals in their eyes and were backlit and gave them glowing red eyes. It was very reminiscent of the Indiana Jones ride at Disneyland, says Winnin. In each of these statues, there were, of course, real snakes hissing and hanging out of each and every hole in the wall. The rangers had to make it through the final obstacle to get to the main volcano chamber to meet Malagor and Divatox. The script was massive, a series of one adventure after another, Winning continues. The original edit was over three hours long, so realistically it had to be cut down. The real problem was that the script was just too rich and ambitious, which is a good thing, but was ultimately frustrating. The biggest physical set created was the volcano where Divatox would attempt to sacrifice Jason and Kimberly in order to bring forth Malagor. It was built inside a warehouse in Los Angeles. It was an impressive, massive set about the size of half a football field. There, Kimberly and Jason are turned evil, complete with glowing red eyes after Divatox lowers them into the volcano's lava, and the former teammates end up battling the active Power Rangers. The decision to depict two of the Power Rangers as evil had an unusual origin. Austin St. John had originally turned down playing Jason Lee Scott in the movie, but co-director Shucky Levy asked him to reconsider. He did, but one of his conditions was that Jason turn evil in the story because he felt it would be more fun to play the character as a bad guy. St. John and Levy compromised. Jason and Kimberly would turn evil, but only temporarily when they're sacrificed at Malagor's temple. After a script rewrite, St. John signed on. Eventually, of course, Jason and Kimberly become good again thanks to the magic of the wizard Leragot. Turbo opened in theatres on March 28, 1997. The Los Angeles Times gave the movie a rave review, praising the fun vibe of the project and Hilary Shepard's larger-than-life performance as Divatox. The movie served as a great launching pad for the next season, Power Rangers Turbo, but unknown to the production team, there was a bumpy ride ahead. 
Now, that's it for all the information we have on the Power Rangers Turbo movie, my friends. If you want me to get into the truth behind the series of Power Rangers Turbo, be sure to let me know in the comments down below. Also, I'd love to know your thoughts on the Turbo movie itself. Obviously, it must kind of exist within a separate universe because of some of the things that happen within it. For example, Malagor being suspiciously similar to future villain Dark Spectre. Just a coincidence? or a cock-up in continuity. Again, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. I really hope you guys enjoyed this one. Another quick reminder to pick up the Power Rangers Ultimate Visual History book. It's written by Jody Revinson and Ramin Zahid. I hope I pronounced those names correctly. And there's a foreword by Amy Jo Johnson. I guarantee you'll all love it, and it's just a nice quality book to go in your collection. So, huge recommendations from me. Thank you all so much for watching today's video. I hope you have a great day, may the power protect you, and I will see you next time on The Sixth Ranger.